Good afternoon, class. This is our lecture in Scientific Revolution. I'm going to focus on a very Eurocentric worldview of events governing the development of scientific knowledge. The events in Europe can be divided into four. We can start discussing with Reformation or the Renaissance, but uh, my concern today is scientific uh, revolution. Scientific revolution paved way for the, for the uh, Enlightenment period. So there are four major events in Europe that uh, will comprise our scholarship of the Eurocentric view of the world. The Renaissance period, which is the rebirth of idea, we're discovering the Greek. This is the reason why in the 16th century still there's an Aristotelian logic to ideas about world, the universe, and the natural uh, environment. Second is the Reformation, which is the change in religion, which was sparked and exploded by Martin Luther and his followers through their suggested Reformation about uh, the church's doctrine. In fact, the most controversial of that uh, Reformation was the church's indulgence. The church listened to the the content or to that specific thesis against or suggesting the the the, uh, the removal of indulgence from the Catholic doctrine, but uh, other items in the agenda of Reformation were not followed by the church. But anyway, that's a, a separate discussion. After the Reformation period, there was another revolution marked by the establishment of how to research the scientific uh, method, which comprised of uh, uh, drawing hypotheses, doing an experiment, and concluding, which uh, as a final stage would lead to our worldview. Prior to scientific method, the worldview was more of a fixed worldview determined by the, the Christian worldview, and you ought to prove it using the Bible. But uh, during the wake of the scientific revolution, there was a redisciplining of thinking. Uh, there's an emphasis on qualitative observation and, and quantitative research. There's a re-education of our common sense and logic. Uh, of course, there's an introduction of scientific inquiry. All this happened during the scientific revolution. And because it was so rigid about science, there were no scientists at that time, but there, there were proto-scientists. It was revolutionary. It contradicted the church's doctrine. And uh, it was also the impetus for the next major event in Europe, which was the Enlightenment period. But during which period, we know, according to history books, that uh, deism was established, was formalized. Deism believed that there's a master clocksman who wound the clock and let the clock be for eternity. It means to say that the daily lives of human beings are predetermined by pattern of the ticking of the clock. And so God is no longer present in those events. That's deism. It does not cancel out God, but it re idealized God as the creator, as the sole creator, and that he created the pattern, the seed, uh, firsthand, and let the seed grow according to its own pattern and system. It still believes that God exists, that God created, but it does not believe that God has an influence in our day-to-day -day lives. The way you think today will not be governed by the hand of God if you jump and decide to eat a hamburger today is not governed by God. That's the idea of deism. Even in the 16th century, the medieval thinking was still reigning. What is this medieval thinking? It is based on religious thinking. Now, Goldman in 1964 had written uh, about religious thinking by saying that it is no different from non-religious thinking. I can't really decide right now if this way of thinking about religious thinking, that it is similar to non-religious, is viable. I need to read up furthermore on related literature supporting or pro probably arguing against uh, Goldman's uh, thinking. But 
the basic fact probably from his point of view he wanted to merge the secular world and the religious world that religious thinking is still practical i think that he's framing that and and non-religious thinking is nothing short in terms of level in terms of importance so both are on the scale they are being balanced out in our everyday thinking opportunities there's another another definition by gold richard liu and richard lewonton they said that it's a side effect of our drive or tendency to thrive or survive his view and richard lewonton and gold's view is highly anthrop- anthropological since they mentioned tendency to thrive i i can mention animism and the belief in deities here as the outcome of our tendency to thrive these are the superstitious beliefs that aided our ancestors to produce reasons or causes for natural phenomenon which for them were very mysterious which for them hard to explain now since explanation is not ready made they created their own explanation by looking out seeking out the invisible since they cannot find the invisible it's paradox what they concocted was an explanation that there must be an unseen force governing the creation of rain the creation of wind i mean the existence and then their their the, the way that they produce typhoon the way that the natural world produce the ebb and flow of water they attributed it to gods and goddesses religious thinking can address theological and philosophical reflection now, this is more formalized thinking if you label religious thinking as theological and philosophical there's a whole range of study for you to enter into theological and a whole range of study as well separate from theological not necessarily synonymous with theological focusing on philosophical thought or thinking another contention about religious thinking is it is based on christian thought it's a big word there christian thought that means we're talking about a community of christians who share belief and world view or christian thought could be a phenomenon it is a revolution on its own i believe so boyer 2003 posited that religious thinking is part of our mental system that it is inevitable because we're creating this model in our mind to explain animism to explain agency of rain and other natural phenomena we can also think of the medieval conception of the world as part of a political thinking because even the kings or the the concept of divine rights of the king is both religious and political or combined religious uh, religious and uh, political uh, ideology the competition to become king is participated in by the church the church favors or patronize one particular monarch so together the monarch and the church govern the world govern the eurocentric world i i think one cannot sit down throughout the process of revolution because it starts and unfolds very slowly in fact the scientific revolution had started during the renaissance period then reformation came and then the explosion happened during the establishment of scientific community in 17th century during which time the scientific method had been demonstrated by galileo galilei and then had caught on other scientists who also formalized like francis bacon the kind of thinking and process of scientific experiment that had been done by Galileo Galilei It was important in the Renaissance period to pay attention to the impact of the printing press without it the Renaissance would not happen and probably there will be a huge gap 
and the development of uh, the scientific world will be postponed. Because the printing press invention had hastened literacy and the transmission of knowledge. They started it with manuscript uh, printing for the church, but it had been used also for secular reasons. And this had paved way for printing out your your scientific data or printing out your your letters pertaining to the writing of a theory. It recorded both events in the church and events also in the scientific community, in the proto-scientific community. We can also attribute the faster development of the Renaissance through, uh, I mean, to Mariner's Compass and Gunpowder. We are aware that the European colony was expansive because it went overseas. Now, what did they do? They used guns, they used this compass to conquer worlds, to conquer states and countries. The compass to guide them in navigation, gunpowder to use force. Until Nicholas Copernicus had made a noise in Europe when he wrote on the revolutions of heavenly spheres, which challenged Ptolemy's view. If you, you can imagine how fearful Nicholas Copernicus was to publish his work, he did not publish immediately because he knew that uh, he was challenging the church's idea or the church's foothold on explaining as astronomy or explaining the phenom phenomenon of the celestial body. And then Tycho Brahe had improved on the foundation or foundational idea or seminal work of Nicholas Copernicus. He approved, though he was not intentional in doing so, the theory of Copernicus as correct through his mathematical equation. So he made and validated Copernican theory using mathematical terms. Then Johannes Kepler, Kepler wrote about laws of planetary motions. He specified three laws that the motion path is elliptical, right? Or the orbiting path is elliptical, not perfectly round. He also proposed that planets do not move in uniform speed. And thirdly, he posited that time is directly or the time that it takes to revolve around the sun is directly proportional to the size of the planet. And then Galileo, Galilei, came. He was popular for using the telescope as an experimental tool, as an experiment tool. Now, prior to Galileo, Galilei, stargazers did not use the instrument, did not use the lens to magnify their vision of celestial body. Can you imagine how difficult it was to draw a theory of planetary motion by just observing the sky with your naked eye? Galileo had set the foundation, if you look up history book uh, pertaining to scientific revolution, he was the first one who was attributed the scientific method. In fact, uh, he gained the title, the father of scientific method. What he did was, he drew hypothesis, and then he did experimentation uh, control versus uh, experimental group, and then he proceeded with his conclusion. The conclusion, again, will become the worldview or part of challenging the worldview. Galileo was also holding back and uh, valued his life, so he, he retracted his theory uh, some sort of because of the church's pressure and threat. So can, I could imagine he was afraid of what was going to happen to his life if he be, became, a, uh, if he would become a prisoner. He's also attributed for the theory of gravity, the gravitational pull that it's present on Earth. 
again because of the inquisition of Pope Urban, he was forced to retract his theory. Galileo Galilei demonstrated that he was not just an astronomer. Because of his use of scientific method, he became formally a scientist. Francis Bacon is another persona of scientific revolution who formalized Galileo Galilei's method of thinking. He mentioned that uh, the very first thing that should be done in research, in, in, in scientific inquiry rather, is observation. And then formulation of hypothesis. Okay? Hypothesis that later on you're going to prove using experimental procedure. And then, just like what, what uh, Galileo Galil Galilei, you would write about your findings and then conclude about your findings. That's the final stage of the scientific method. Then, Rene Descartes had introduced deductive method of thinking. If Galileo Galilei introduced inductive thinking, Descartes did the opposite. He used deductive thinking by starting with what is already observed in reality. In his deductive method, he sort of made himself as the actual subject. He said, to prove his existence, cognito ergo sum, he must use logic. And the logic was, he is thinking and capable of thinking and know that at the moment he is thinking, therefore, he exists. I think, therefore, I am. The am there is the being, existing or the existence of the being. That's deductive thinking. He was able to start with what is already incontestable. Okay? The self is incontestable. The presence of the self is incontestable. That's why he was able to use himself as an experiment uh, or has, as, a, as a thought experiment okay? using deductive thinking. He's also attributed for separating the logic or the, the subject of spiritual and material in our scientific inquiry. If it is something spiritual, it is unseen, therefore the phenomenon should be taken up by logical deductive thinking. Whereas if it is material, if the issue or the subject is material, then it can be taken up by experimental inductive procedure. In the spiritual, he attributed it to something that can't be seen. So if you wish to conclude on something that is not seen, then you use logic and logic alone, deductive thinking. Whereas if it is tangible, can be observed using our senses, then you can use the, the scientific experiment or the inductive method. In modern scientific method, we see that there is a general rule, a universal concept. And, and even the scientific method process itself okay, is a general conditions for an authentic outcome of scientific inquiry to happen. The final stages of the scientific revolution was very tensed because of the force of reformation, the Protestant force gaining its political clout in the Eurocentric world. The final period of the scientific revolution was marked by an overarching theory formulated by Isaac Newton. So he combined the theory of Tycho Brahe, Copernicus, Galileo Galilei, and formulated the Newton's law of motion. Well, if not for Galileo's gravity, he would not be able to uh, to advance in his uh, Newton's law. Well, of course, he, 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 uh, he wrote about body attracts body, and this is unchangeable, meaning constant. It would make the motion of the planet predictable. To jump off to the Enlightenment uh, period, Isaac Newton was actually quintessential for paving the way towards this uh, deism. As mentioned a while ago, God's influence is not needed. He, he proved that, uh, Isaac Newton. 
with these laws of motion in place, explaining the celestial body's motion and movement, and explaining the origin and probably the the uh, the creation of uh, universes, God is no longer needed in the equation. He did not cancel out God. He explained that the natural forces take over, which is congruent to saying that God does not make you jump anymore. God does not make you eat anymore. God does not move the waves anymore, okay? Or blow the wind and uh, create rain at this instance. So, enlightenment had been opened up furthermore by Isaac Newton. By now, I want you to reflect. Since we've focused on astronomical observations and uh, scientific inquiry, by now, you can reflect on how Isaac Newton, Tycho Brahe, Galileo Galilei, and Nicholas Copernicus had influenced society. Were they responsible for creating a modern society? Can we still attribute to them what we are experiencing right now in terms of the providence of technology? If they were not able to come up with scientific theories, what would be our thinking of the world or of the universe today? Let's pause for a while to allow you to contemplate on answers to those essential questions.